Inspektor Asyadu wa la ilaha illallah Asyadu wa la ilaha illallah Asyadu wa muhammad rasulullah Asyadu wa muhammad rasulullah Hai ala al-sana Hai ala al-fala Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar La ilaha illallah إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم Verily all praise and thanks belong to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our sins. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. And whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. <clears throat> I bear witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is His final messenger. Allah says in the Quran Karim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who believe, be mindful of Allah. Remember Allah and make sure that if you die, you die in a state of submission. Amma ba'd. Furthermore, last week we talked about the exodus and the hijrah. The Exodus is Allah saving Musa and his people, and the Hijrah was the migration from Mecca to Medina. When we look at in the light of these two stories <clears throat> related to two prophets and related to a people, we find that it involved hardship, it involved persecution, and it involved having strong faith in Allah, strong belief in Allah, and also trust in Allah, which was a result of helping them get through these hardships. Now we saw the story of Musa salam. they were at the point of the body of water and the people said, oh Musa, we are going to be overtaken. And Musa said, never, Allah would, with me is Allah and he will guide me. Now when we go to the present situation that we live in now, we have a reality and the reality is is that we're facing some hardships that are not new. We're, fa we're facing some <clears throat> intolerance that is not new. And that's when we look at in New York in August, there was an imam that was leaving the mosque and he was killed. He was just leaving the mosque from prayer and he was killed. Recently in the UK, there was a boy by the name of Assad. And Assad, this boy was being bullied in school. And he couldn't take it no more. So he went home and he killed himself in his room. And also we have the current situation where, the political situation, in which we have a candidate that calls for the banning of Muslims in this country, right? And calls for a banning of Muslims in our country. This is our country. The, the reality is that we should not we should not lose hope and we should not lose faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Now let's go back. Let's travel back to the time of the Prophet in Mecca. Mecca was dear to the Prophet ﷺ. Like many of our lands are dear to us. Even though, yes, Mecca is always, we always remember Mecca because of the hardship that the believers faced in Mecca. But Mecca was the place where Allah told Ibrahim to leave his Ismail and Hajar. Mecca was the place that was chosen by Allah for his house, the Kaaba, to be built. Mecca was the birthplace of, is the birthplace of Rasulullah sallallahu And Mecca is the place where the first verses of the Qur'an, the first word of the Qur'an was revealed. But Mecca was also a place of suffering. Abu Bakr, the close friend of the Prophet, the best friend of the Prophet, after the message of Islam was three years in secret, finally, the believers get a chance and Abu Bakr was asking, can I go by the Kaaba and can I make a sermon inviting people to Islam? So finally they got permission and when they got permission, uh, during that time, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib accepted Islam on that occasion. Abu Bakr, while giving the sermon, was beaten up. His face was bruised and was filled with blood. While on the floor, they continued kicking him, stomping on him, hitting him with their slippers or their shoes or their footwear to such an extent that he went unconscious. This is the best friend of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Bakr, when he regained his consciousness, the first thing that he asked about was, is the Messenger of Allah okay? That was the first thing that came to the mouth of Abu Bakr. After regaining his consciousness, is the Messenger of Allah okay? Uthman ibn Affan, the one who's called Dhul Nurain. Uthman ibn Affan was called Dhul Nurain. Why was he called Dhul Nurain? Because he married two of the Prophet's daughters. When he married one, and that one passed away, then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grants him the opportunity to marry a second daughter. So he was called the possessor of two lights, Ruqayya and Umkulthum. Uthman ibn Affan, his uncle, used to put a mat for Uthman to lay down. And then will lift this mat in fire while Uthman was laying down. Musa ibn Umair was considered the star of Mecca. Like if you think about what do you consider a star? You know, a famous singer, he wears this line of clothes, he, he wears these shoes, he wears these type of glasses, he wears these, this type of watch, he wears this type of chain, he drives this type of car. Musa ibn Umair was that in, in Mecca. He had the best footwear imported from Yemen, which at that time was like the Italian shoes nowadays. Very expensive. And he wore the best dress. And he wore the best oil, the musk. To such an extent that whenever people will smell in the air the oil, they will say, Musa passed through here. He used to leave the traces of it. Musa ibn Umair was rich. When he accepted Islam, his mother forced him to starvation. And his mother said, if you don't leave Islam, you're no longer my son. And Musa, the way he responded was, 
what the Messenger of Allah offers me is better. So Musa ibn Umair, when he died in the second, second battle of Islam in Uhud, they didn't have enough to cover him, to bury him. The, the, the cloth only was able to reach his knees and the rest they covered him with leaves. And he died chopped up. He lost an arm, another arm, but he didn't let go of the, he held the, the, the flag. So Musa ibn Umair being rich, gave up all of this just for his belief in Allah and for his belief in the Prophet Bilal ibn Rabah. Bilal, the first Mu'addin, the first caller of prayer. If you go to China, the Mu'addin will make the Adhan in Arabic. And if you ask a person that knows about Islam, ask them, who is Bilal? They will know that it was the first that it was the first Mu'addin in the history of Islam. But before he was a Mu'addin, he was a slave. And when he accepted Islam, the boys of Mecca were told to wrap a rope around his neck. And he used to be dragged in the streets of Mecca. And he also was forced to starvation and other types of, of abuse. Even though all of this suffering took place, it didn't taint the love that the Messenger of Allah had for Mecca. And as we mentioned last week, when the Messenger of Allah was leaving Mecca, he says, By Allah, he's talking to Mecca, By Allah, you are the most pleasant city and dearest place for me to live. Had my people not expelled me, I would not have lived elsewhere. So this is the love of the Prophet ﷺ for Mecca. Even though he experienced all that hardship, he did not abandon his faith. There is a moment in Juma where the dua is accepted. I pull up all the ayat. I was tafsir ali walakum was tafsirun al ghafur rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam wa la shayf al mursaim wa la ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. All praise and thanks are due to Allah. And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon His final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions and all those who follow him until the day of judgment. When we... Uh, pizza's here. Inshallah. When we look at the lessons of the migration, of the hijrah, we find that there are many lessons. One is that one must have true faith in God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And this faith was the one that made the prophets and the believers be able to endure 13 years of struggle in, in, in Mecca. Also, this faith was one that was demonstrated by, by the actions, right? The believers, they didn't say, I believe, but they demonstrated, they struggled, they didn't give up. They still prayed, they didn't give up their, their obedience <clears throat> to Allah and His Messenger. Also, as we mentioned previously, the, the Hijrah teaches us the importance of good companionship. The Hijrah teaches us that we must have true trust and reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, <clears throat> when we look at ways to nurture our Iman, the, our Iman is nurtured by our, our worship. So for example, the first thing is to believe in Allah. And who is Allah? Allah is the one 
God worthy of being worshipped. There's nothing like unto Him. He has no partners. He is the first, nothing is before Him. He is the last, nothing is after Him. He is the Almighty, He is the All-Wise, He is the All-Knower, He is the All-Merciful, He is the All-Forgiven. He is the one that accepts the repentance of His servants. So that develop and nurture in this true belief in Allah. And that true belief in Allah should be translated into action. So that true belief in Allah should be one that should lead us to make sure that we guard our prayers. If we're not guarding our prayers, then our belief is not as good as we think it is. If we're not guarding our prayers, then our Iman is not as strong as we believe in it. Because Salah is the connection between the servant and the Lord. The way to nurture this Iman is also through reading the Qur'an. Right? But reading it to comprehend it. Sometimes we read it to get by it. To finish it. But do you know that the Qur'an has commands? And the commands have certain obligations. And when these commands come, that means what? That we have to respond. So if Allah says, Hafidu ala salawati wa salati al-wusta Guard your prayers, especially the middle prayer. Wa qumu lillahi qanite And when you start in pray, start, stand in prayer, stand with humility. You're into it. You're connected with, with Allah. You're into it. You're connected with Allah. And, and that prayer, if it was your last prayer, is having an effect on your internal. Right? It's having an effect. And therefore, when you leave the prayer, you leave with a, a, a motivation <clears throat> to do good. So you have to nurture. So this guarding of your prayers, the reading of the Qur'an, in, a, in, in the way you understand it, whether it is in English, in Arabic, in Urdu, in Chinese, Whatever language you understand best, and that's the language that you're dreaming. Right? That language that you're dreaming, that's the language that you understand most. So therefore, you should try to build this relationship with the Qur'an. And at first, you're going to come across, if you're doing it in the English language, you're going to come across many different translations. And... In translation, you become at the you you become at the mercy of the translator because the translator is choosing what he thinks it means, right? So therefore, if you search for Quran that impacts you the most, you also try to you also try to look around. And it's going to take some looking around to see what Qur'an benefits you the most. There is a moment in Jummah when the du'a is accepted. So we mentioned that nurturing our Iman in Allah and demonstrating in action. Nurturing our trust in Allah. That in times of hardship, we really trust Allah. That when, when we're tested, that the first response is Alhamdulillah. Like we say, it's all good. Maybe Allah has something better planned. Let me look at the positive of this hardship. Let me see, like if you get a flat tire. Like one time I was dressed like this, and I'm going to Juma. Juma. And I have two flat tires. And I live 30 minutes away. And I was a new Muslim. My immediate response was, Alhamdulillah. Maybe Allah is protecting me from an accident that's along the way. And He's not decreeing for me to get involved in that accident. So I, I left the car. 
and I walk to the bus stop. The bus stop, the bus takes like 30 minutes. On the way, while I waited for the bus, that's another 30 minutes. So I'm missing Juma. I said to myself, SubhanAllah, you know, I get, I'm going to get the same reward as if I sat in Juma. Even though I got to the mosque and it's empty, it's okay. That's the mindset that I had when I had that somebody stabbed two of my tires. I didn't get upset. My first response was Alhamdulillah. I'll take a bus and whenever I make it to the mosque, I had the intention to pray, so I got the reward for the intention. Whether there is people and there is no people, whether I listened to the khutbah or I didn't listen to the khutbah, because I had the intention to go, I didn't make it, it wasn't my fault, I took the means, I was ready, I took a shower, I got dressed, I had two flat tires. Right, so that's the iman and the trust in Allah and the hope and the reward that we should have. And last, is that the, we have to be good doers regardless of who it is related to. You have to always, every opportunity in life, you should be trying to do something good. You try to plug in something good. Somebody serious, make them laugh. Just even randomly. Say a joke that the guys, what are you talking about? Just to get them off that mindset of being serious. Right? Just try to you know, motivate someone. Make them feel good. You have an old person. They're carrying bags. Can I help you? That's it. Your teachers. Try to be always helpful before they even ask. You have some kids that don't have our principles, that don't even want to help, that curse at the teachers, that don't like the teachers. These are educators. Teachers, when they leave school, they go home, they work, and they're, they're, ch they're checking papers, they're, they're, they're putting the grades in the... It's a never-ending job. It's not only in school. They're too busy in school teaching classes. They go home, and they have to prepare the, pro the, 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 the classes for the next day, grade exams, and do all this work just for students, regardless if they're good or bad. So Allah tells us that we have to be united. Like this, you came together to Juma. In your schools, identify Muslims. Whether they like it or not, give them salams. Say, Assalamu Alaikum. Whether you get a response or not. When I became Muslim, that was the worst part. The worst part is that when I used to see Muslims in the streets, and I used to live in the city, so in the city there's a lot of people. And you had some Muslims that felt ashamed of Islam. I would say, Salaam alaykum. The guy would just put his head down and walk. I'm like, what's wrong with this person? You know, the Prophet said, when somebody says, Salaam alaykum, you respond, Wa alaykum as -salam. So I used to force myself to find a Muslim just to say, Salaam alaykum. And he's like, man, this guy's putting me on the spot. My name is, you know, he even changed his name from Muhammad to Mo, right? Right? Or from Mazin to Mace, right? And he changed his name, so now I'm, I'm putting him on, on the spot like, Assalamu alaikum, huh? Yeah, you. Wa alaikum salam. And honestly, I went from not having respect from even the police. Almost every day being in trouble with the police. So then after I became Muslim, the police used to drive by in the bikes. Those police that used to arrest me sometimes. And they began to say, Assalamu Alaikum. Even the police. Even neighbors used to come to the, the, the place that I used to work in. And they used to say, Assalamu alaikum, out of respect. So you have people that are not Muslim, not ashamed of saying, Assalamu alaikum, which is the greeting of paradise, the greeting of the prophets, which means, peace be unto you, you're praying for the person that you're greeting. You're doing them a favor, even though they don't know. And the, there's a benefit, even though you don't get a response. The Prophet said, saying, Assalamu alaikum, 
softens the heart softens the heart and brings you together. So you do it. You initiate it. So Allah so Allah's mess Allah says in the Quran, Hold on to the rope of Allah together. And do not be divided. Like when you come to the mosque, let's say in Ramadan, and you know you have your boys, you have your girls, your friends. Boys I'm talking about you boys and girls I'm talking about your girls. I'm not talking about you boys having your girls. That's not what I'm talking about, right? But, and sometimes we, we become kind of tribal. We stick only to our best friends, right? And this is, I'm just gonna be with this person, right? And sometimes we don't, we have to break that habit into trying to be together. If somebody's by themselves calling them over, being the best person, not the one that divides. Allah says, hold on to the rope of Allah. And the rope of Allah means the Qur'an, and it also means the group. Hold on to the rope of Allah together and be not divided. How did the new believers in Mecca deal with those hardships? Because they were together. They supported each other. If they were divided, they would have gotten broken up. They wouldn't be able to tolerate 13 years of suffering. Here, we have a golden opportunity where in some schools you can do khutbahs, you can do, you can have MSAs, alhamdulillah you can come to, to the mosque. You know, you, you can come to the mosque and not, not be like the kids in Syria. The kids in Syria, the mosques are getting bombed. Right, their schools, they have no schools. Hospitals destroyed. Right? You have a mosque, safe, calm, you can drive to you can drive to school, you can go to you can go home and you're safe. So you should enjoy that blessing, inshallah. Allah mandina fi man hadaik wa afina fi man afait wa tawallana fi man tawallait wa barik lana fi ma atait wa qina shara ma qadait fa inna kataqdi wa la yuqsa alayk inna wa la yadidu man walait wa la yadidu man adait wa alak tarabana wa ta'alaik wa sallallahu mubarak ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala wa sallam ajma'in alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin